Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to our special fireside event here to celebrate Mental Health Month, uh, October, uh, every year it is, for those who don't know. Uh, welcome to our event today. We're here to, as for those who have been part of our firesides, to speak all things mental health and well-being. And we've been interviewing a range of leaders from across sectors to understand how they have implemented health and well-being in their organisations and how they also build well-being uh, in themselves as well. For those who don't know, my name is Tegan. I'm the General Manager of the Oranges Toolkit and I'm completely thrilled that you're here with us by this virtual fireside. Um, to start with today, in terms of technology, uh, if you have any tech problems, feel free to connect directly to John. Uh, so in the uh, panelist, uh, sorry, in the participants function rather, you can simply just uh, press on John, the tech support name and message him directly. Uh, you can also engage actively in today's session. If you have any questions at all for our panelists, please feel free to send them through. I've got the chat function up here in my screen. If you see me dotting my eyes up there, it's because I'd, I'd love to know, first of all, where you're dialing in from today. And also if you have any questions as well. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're all dialing in from today. For me, that's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And look, this was a picture taken um, from a couple of kilometres from my house a couple of weeks ago, actually. And, and I was hoping to take a new photo this morning to share with you, but uh, the, the traditional land that I'm on today or the owners of the traditional land uh, might not have probably been able to take this beautiful photo because in Melbourne there was a massive storm last night um, and there was no walking this morning. But I think this is a beautiful image to, yeah, to evoke us to think about the land that we're all dialing in from today. And, and I'd encourage you to reflect on the traditional owners and how they may have used the land um, that you're dialing in from today. So feel free to let us know the land that you are coming in from. I'd also like to tell you a little bit about the Oranges Toolkit for those who are new. I know there are a few newbies. I can see some names there and also some lovely familiar names as well. For those who don't know much about us, uh, we have a pretty unique story from childhood cancer, actually. Uh, but basically, the Oranges Toolkit builds mental and emotional agility through seriously refreshing workplace wellbeing training programs and services. And we work with the likes um, of Henley Properties, and we're interviewing Craig today, as well as some other key organisations in Australia, both in the public and the private sector. Uh, and wonderful Angie, she's already on it. Um, thank you, Angie. I don't think she has internet today, so she's hot spotting here in Melbourne. We're, we're, we're uh, going, you know, rogue in terms of our technology. So thanks, Angie. For those who don't know much about us, you can click on the link and learn a bit more about our story. But basically, we're also a social enterprise and all of our profits, well, our profits rather, go to support Camp Quality uh, as we are Camp Quality Social Enterprise. So thanks for joining us today. So let's get started because I tell you what, half an hour moves very fast. Uh, this is our last fireside chat and I'd love to to welcome Craig to the to the floor. And for those who don't know much about Craig, he leads the uh, customer people and culture function at Henley Properties. I hope I got that right. I, I know there's three titles in Craig's title and he's got more than 20 years experience in this space in organizations like BHP and Telstra and, and Orica as well. So uh, welcome Craig to our virtual fireside today. How are you? Very well, thank you, Tegan. Great to be here. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. So look, we have a bunch of questions um, to ask Craig. And um, as I mentioned, for those who are on the call, please do um, add any questions that you have, but I'll, I'll get started. So Craig, tell us a little bit about Henley Properties for those who don't know much about the organisation. Sure. Well, Henley Properties has been around since 1989. So it started here in Melbourne and then grew into, I guess, one of Australia's largest uh, home builders and uh, today we actually operate mostly down the east coast so Queensland we're known as Plantation Homes we have a business in Sydney which is Edgewater and here and in South Australia we're uh, Henley Homes. Nice beautiful and obviously construction uh, meaning that you're 
uh, industry, just like almost every industry has been impacted by um, COVID-19. So what are some of the challenges that you've faced in terms of building health and wellbeing in not just your organisation or, or what are the challenges mm. even beyond COVID that you're facing as an organisation? Sure. Well, in terms of the organisational challenges, we're actually, I think, privileged that we're able to continue to operate um, during COVID and during lockdown. So uh, being sort of deemed as an essential industry, but I think that's also a privileged position that um, we understood involved a lot of trust. Mm. So we needed to ensure that even though we already operate in a very regulated environment, there are even more rules that need to be complied with to keep everybody safe. And so it's incredibly important, not just for our business, but for the entire industry to be able to demonstrate that we were working together and um, you know, doing everything we could to keep people safe. So um, you know, in that respect, we were, we were quite fortunate that we could uh, trade and operate through, except for perhaps a, a two-week little uh, shutdown mm. weeks ago. Um, the challenges that that's um, presented, though, for us, I think are pretty consistent with, with many other businesses um, that we're able to continue to operate. We very quickly had to have people working remotely. We had to um, have people using different technologies, mm. training differently, and having our customer experience uh, very differently. I mean, it continues to amaze me that uh, the, the housing industry has performed so well and has been so strong, even though customers have not been able to go in and sort of taste or see or feel and experience the homes that they're looking to buy. So it's uh, we've continued to sell, even though our display centres have been closed. And we're actually pretty excited in Victoria. We're opening them for the first time in a long time tomorrow. So oh, great. You know, I'm sure everyone's looking forward to that. Yeah, I think so. And, then, and the challenges that we've had in, in HR, what we call it people and culture, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of well written that in some respects it's been a really exciting time to be in HR. We've been through probably the equivalent of a three or four year sort of cycle, uh, boom, bust and everything in between, all in a very concentrated period. But the, the role in HR to be one focused on business continuity, to be mm. thinking, but uh, our health and safety, to be thinking about how people can continue to perform and what's the culture that needs to be created, albeit a very different one, um, have all been sort of accelerated and in one where there's been just rapid changes. So literally, uh, you know, health orders may change from one day to the next. Mm -hmm. Operating across a number of states, you need to be across everything. So, yeah, the, 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 the team has been doing a fantastic job to, to stay on top of all of that. Yeah, it's really interesting and one of the things that you didn't really necessarily hint on or maybe you kind of did but maybe I'd like to highlight is the pressure that is on HR to do all of those things, to respond to the changing restrictions and to for you particularly as a national organisation to have those, those expertise across states and, you know, in, in the dealings that I've had with people and culture leaders, they're also humans who would have thought um, yeah. and there's huge pressure on HR and I just kind of I think it can be helpful to maybe ask you how you've managed your own well-being during this time because there's as I mentioned mm. some really intense pressures on on leaders at the moment. Well it's yeah it's true there's no doubt and I mean I'll answer how I've been keeping myself uh, well but I think in terms of uh, the team um, not only are they doing all the things I just mentioned, but you know, at the moment, for instance, there's a lot of sensitivity around vaccination. Oh, yeah. You know, some some aspects of that are quite straightforward because the government's mandated vaccination. But you know, you're dealing with people who have some people who have genuine anxiety and genuine concern. And you now our role is to help uh, point them towards really good sources of information, um, and uh, you know, hopefully help them make the best decision, the one that's right for them. But um, it's a really sensitive position that uh, HR are in. And then in terms of the, their own well-being, you know, yeah, they're, they're just like everybody else are dealing with um, children who are, you know, being you know, homeschooled. So our team have also been uh, part-time teachers and part-time, um, you know, spouses and, and part-time HR professionals. And uh, all of that add, adds up to more than 100%. And, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's it's been uh, it's been really intense, and I think that I've noticed, particularly in Victoria here in this last lockdown, but I I think it'd be probably the same in Sydney with their long lockdown. It's just 
just the fatigue. It's it's just been really noticeable uh, amongst uh, amongst the team, and I felt that myself. I think that I felt the wave of this last one particularly uh, challenging. I think, and uh, maybe that's because that uh, at some point we were still having some hope around achieving a sort of a double donut days, which we used to celebrate about a year ago, and then when it became clear that we weren't going to be able to achieve that then there was this sort of sense of, well, what are we trying to achieve and how long is this going to go? So I think that that's one of the things that, um, you know, in human resources, we, we talk about sort of the domains of, um, you know, how you keep people, uh, the social interaction and the more certainty you can provide to people, the more mm. they've got over their future, then um, the better the outcome and uh, the less stress. So we've had this whole situation where collectively the communities have lost autonomy and lost control and been told what to do largely. And that's why I think you're seeing this collective sort of stress and, and fatigue. So uh, we're looking forward to uh, hopefully getting some some uh, freedom and, and being able to do some things of our own choosing. Yeah. And I love that you've brought that up because there's so much science to back up what you were just talking about. When we experience change and uncertainty, it can kind of activate what we call a fear state in our brain. Our brain kind of fires up and becomes, um, you know, hypervigilant to, to mm. its surroundings. And when we're hypervigilant for long periods of time, it does have some wear and tear on us. And I really also like that you've brought up autonomy. It's definitely something I've I've personally reflected on how much I love my freedom and I and I think I've missed like I didn't realize freedom mm. was such an important yeah. part of my well-being but being told to stay in my house for like 300 and something days and not having that autonomy to actually go camping um or you know go out and do the normal well-being um initiatives that I would normally um you know partake in is is something mm. that I think I've learned about myself during COVID is how much I, you know, deeply value my autonomy. Um, so yeah. what are some things that you actually do for your own wellbeing? What are your go-to strategies to keep you fueled up? Well, for me personally, um, I, I, I love to keep active. So cycling's my thing. Uh, I might unkindly be called a mammal from time to time. <laughs> but, um, you know, even if that meant riding around in a five-kilometre bubble, yeah, you know, doing endless uh, loops, um, that was a really important thing just to, mm. to do that. So, uh, you know, one of the benefits, I suppose, of uh, the, the, the lockdowns and everything is that I've travelled a lot less than I normally would. Mm. It's meant that I've actually had more time to be able to, to exercise. So um, that's the main thing I do. And the other one that I, I've now probably two or three years, but uh, I, 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 I know the benefits of mindfulness, but I've never found that I could actually sit down and get my mind to be quiet for long enough to actually um, to do anything with it. But I came across a podcast uh, that um, interviews Sam Harris and he has a great um, app called uh, Waking Up, which I've, mm. I've dived into pretty deeply. So that's become a part of my toolkit. Oh, I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Mm. It's um, interesting that you're talking about how hard it is to quiet the mind. And, and most new meditators stop because they think, oh, my God, I'm supposed to quiet. My mind is active and I can't stop it. And mm -hmm. what we know is that when people first start meditating, they actually become so, super hyper aware of their thinking. And then they think that they're failing at it. But actually, that's part of the experience. That sometimes it hurts a little bit before it kind of, you know, evens out. And I like to mm -hmm. think of it from a, a physical point of view. You know that in order to get fit, the first two three, four, seven, 20 times you go to the gym, uh, it's going to hurt because you know you haven't moved your body that much. And so there's this kind of pain threshold that, inc well, not threshold, but pain that increases, but, you know, mm -hmm. longer term, there's this softening to it. So, um, yeah, I love that you've kind of mentioned the, the power of mindfulness and and it's so much research backing us up around the, the importance of it. I think that's what I like particularly about Sam's work as well is that there's a lot of science behind what yeah. he does. So I connected with that. And it's just something that particularly worked for me. And he also recognises that um, mindfulness doesn't have to be some sort of blissful Zen-like state, um, you know, that maybe is sort of a, what people immediately think of, that actually the mind is messy and the experience yeah. is messy. And, and that's what you need to be aware of, is be aware of all the flood of the thoughts and the reactions to those thoughts. And, and hopefully uh, in, in sort of the cut and thrust of everyday life, you can have that very brief moment of just understanding that uh, 
there's something going on here, don't get carried away. I just think, mm. and that extra sort of second or two helps you, you know, respond differently to a situation than perhaps you might have otherwise done. So, uh, look, I'm, I'm still got my old plates on, but uh, working at it. Haven't we all, even though I've been practicing for years, I, I feel like I'm not even quite with my L plates. Um, it takes a lot of time and a lot of practice to, to have that um, discipline. And what you're sort of mentioning around, you know, being able to sort of respond in a different way is called emotional intelligence. And we know that that is a big predictor of a successful leader, the ability to understand your emotions quickly, to respond in a way that's going to be helpful for yourselves and with others is is really crucial for for Mm -hmm. leadership, particularly during times of crisis and change, because when we think about the health and well-being of our staff, they need uh, managers who are generous with their energy and who understand their own trigger points so that they're, you know, they've got the the leadership they need going through Mm -hmm. this, um, yeah, the change that they're, they're particularly dealing with. And so there, if we think about back to sort of employees and what you've been doing, are there any initiatives mm. that you have seen in your time, whether it's at um, mm. Henley or, or other organisations, any good wellbeing initiatives that you think have really worked um, that you would love to share with our people dialing in? Yeah, I think so. Look, there, there's been a number and I think one of the things that uh, I've learned is that obviously there's no one size fits all. People... Uh, respond to different things and have different needs at different times. And so um, one of the things that we've um, been doing at Henley is actually using a multitude of different things. And and whether that's thinking about nutrition or physical fitness or mindfulness or anxiety or resilience. And, you know, obviously we've been, we've been working with the Oranges Toolkit as well. And that's been a really important part for us as well. And I like that there are different elements, even within the Oranges Toolkit that some people will find useful and maybe other pieces they can put away and use at another time. So that's that's been important. Um, another thing that uh, we did recently that seemed to really strike a, a chord was re- really thinking about sort of our values around um, you know, families. Um, we know that kids have been perhaps, you know, struggling, particularly during, during lockdown. So came across a... Um, a renowned paediatrician, a guy in Melbourne called um, Dr. Billy Garvey, who works at the Royal Children's Hospital, and uh, invited him to actually come and conduct a webinar, which we had, uh, I think, over 400 people attend. And Billy really just spoke about um, how to recognise when kids are, str- are struggling and mm-hmm. some tips for parents. But it wasn't really just for, for people with parent, uh, with kids either. I think it was actually universally applicable advice that he was providing and so that's the exact that's the sort of an example of things that we're going to um, can, we are doing and we'll continue to do over the next um, phase of our well-being program so they're the sort of intentional things that we're doing and um, another thing that I, I, I did want to mention I suppose what are we doing was and it sort of goes back to the point around autonomy and certainty is um, there was a lot of uncertainty about what was going to happen in people's lives in terms of not only like job security and can I work from the office or can I not and what are we going to have to do and what are the rules and all that sort of stuff. We recognised um, really early on the power of leadership communication, like having really simple, plain language, um, share your own t- story with people, and try and provide as much certainty. So, uh, you know, we came out to people and said, Things like we we definitely don't know what's going to happen, but we're fairly certain that the future of work in terms of location for Henley will be some sort of hybrid. Okay. So if you if you're worried about the fact that, you know, am I always going to have to be at home? Well, no, probably not. If you think you're concerned about always being in the office, probably not either. It's going to be a mix of that and we'll we'll work with you and we'll provide you some support in finding something that works for you and also for the business. And so um, providing consistent communication, telling people what we know as soon as we could possibly tell them was, um, I think, um, probably obvious and most businesses were doing it, but it seemed to be something that our people really connected with and we got some great feedback on. Mm. Yeah, and it's quite funny. I've heard this from many businesses that 
the, the pandemic kind of forced them to communicate better and more regularly than before. And in some respects, there's some research saying that people felt more connected than ever before, even though, you know, there wasn't that beautiful water cooler mm. conversations that, you know, we've definitely sort of all missed. I, I know I definitely have. And I think, yeah, communication is vitally important when you're trying to reduce uncertainty and, and create that certainty for sure. And um, for those who are dialing in, feel free to um, f- flick through any questions, by the way. We'd love um, to answer them if you have any for, for Craig, but I'll just keep going because I've got like a million questions because I think he's just got such wisdom uh, to share with the network. So we're like a year and a half, two years into the pandemic and of course, retros- you retrospect, oh my God, I can't even think of the word today. It's Friday and it's been a big week. I'll just say a non-fancy word. Looking back at the last two years, mm. what do you think you would do differently in terms of your leadership or your well-being? Um, yeah, what would you do mm. differently? Um, in terms of my own well-being I think there's something around sort of setting expectations and, and this actually does play out to leadership but what I'm what I have in mind and what I wanted to share was that I think at the beginning and it was fairly new and people were baking sourdough and homebrew and learning languages and there was this free time and there was a sense of novelty around it and I um kind of struggled with that a bit maybe felt a bit of a failure that I wasn't doing those things yeah and learning to actually just sit with my own thoughts because there was more time. It wasn't, you know, wasn't taking kids to basketball and filling my spare time with lots of other things that needed to be done, socialising and everything. And um, so that's probably one. And then in terms of expectations, probably expectation on myself and also the business as a, as a leader is around just accepting the fact that the KPIs and all the things that we'd set in terms of normal performance hurdles and benchmarks, it may not apply Mm. (laughs) enough when we're in, you know, a a sort of a lockdown situation and people are dealing with a whole bunch of other things as well. So, uh, so, so it's a learning maybe rather than I, I do it differently, but it's just a continued, continued sort of thinking around ensuring that, you know, we, we're, we're mindful of the whole situation that's going on for people. And if I, if we normally expect that, um, you know, certain things are done within a certain period of time, continuing to hold on to those, mm. given everything that's changed is, is, is kind of, you know, you're on a fool's error and it's not going to, it's not going to work so well. <laughs> so it's, um, it's just been continuing to refine um, the targets, if you like, and mm. of myself and others. We um, were having a conversation just a couple of days ago about the importance of job design, particularly during this period. And I think you've definitely nailed nailed it on the head there around reducing workload and being okay with not meeting the KPIs we thought we were going to, because everyone thought 2021 was going to be better. You know, we all had this mm. idea that the, the pandemic was going to be sort of over. And I think it kind of shocked many of us. Um, and I've definitely seen it even in our team and in myself. I'm just not as sharp as I normally would be. And I'm tired and I can't wait for my whole week off next week just to actually not think about work for a bit and, and to be okay with not operating at 100%, I think is difficult for many people. Um, and, and I think, yeah, if, if all of us took a little time to reflect on the fact that we're not operating probably at 100, I think we could yeah, I work smarter um, individually and collectively. So we've got about five minutes to go. Um, so a couple other questions for you. Um, in terms of in terms of leadership, what do you think are the future skills that either HR or general leaders will need for the future in terms of capabilities? Well, it's, it's, it's just not my thoughts, but um, Deloitte's do um, a, a deep piece of research every year on predicting future trends of the workplace. And the, the trend for 
21, 22 was all around the human, the human mm. experience. And if, if ever, anything that we've learnt in the last 18 months, it's been around the human experience. We've met, uh, we've met kids and dogs mm -hmm. and, and siblings and everything of our employees. We've, we've been in each other's living rooms. We, we understand, I think, more around the human. And we've seen people, I think, uh, being prepared to be more vulnerable and uh, share their stories in a way that hasn't perhaps been done before. So I think the skills around people uh, for, for leaders will be to continue to, to build on, on, on that in terms of themselves building trust by being prepared to be vulnerable with their teams and uh, being um, prepared to you know, spend or invest the time on um, you know, building resilience and mental health and um, you know, addressing all of those things around that we talked about, certainty and autonomy and mm. those, those sorts of things. So the, the, the human piece will be important. And the other thing will be that um, the, it's not really related to, to mental health, but uh, you know, clearly we're all communicating and collaborating in different ways. And, the role of technology and the whole digital experience, it's just all coming together so quickly. You know, at Henley, two years ago, we rarely had a, a meeting where people had their cameras on. Now we rarely have one where they don't. We're all experiencing Zoom fatigue, which is a real thing. Mm. So leaders need to be able to use the technology, I think, and, and, and uh, you know, figure out a way to get stuff done without perhaps having everyone all together in a room as well able to get the best out of people in different ways i think there's some skills there around those two mm. it's um interesting that you said it might not necessarily be directly associated with mental health but it absolutely is a sense of connection a sense of mm. feeling competent you were talking about autonomy and there's there's a theory called the self-determination theory and i suspect you probably know about it but for those who don't the kind of three aspects around you know, the things we need in our lives and it's autonomy, sense of choice, relatedness, a sense of connecting with others and competence. If we don't feel competent enough to use the technology or to engage, if we don't feel connected and if we don't feel like we have choice in the things we do, it will ultimately undermine our, our well-being, whether we sort of actively know it or not. If you think about what well-being initiatives will look like for, for you and the business in the future, are there any ideas you want to share with people at home anything new that um maybe you haven't shared yet oh look one thing that we uh, actually just shared with our, our workforce today was uh, a partnership that we have with a company in queensland which is called trademark which um uh, developing some shirts which are put on the back some sort of messages around let's just get the conversation started because uh we know that in construction um you know mm. it's a it's a male workforce of a certain age where there have been um, some challenges in the past and we need to get the conversation started. So we're encouraging um, not only our sort of construction and, and trades um, staff to, to, to get involved, but everybody to get involved in getting the conversations started and, and, and moving forward. So that's one thing that we're pretty excited about and um, we'll be um, having some other programs on, on the top of that as part of a new wellbeing program. Yep. You know, it's those small embedding tools that just can never be understated you know when you see a message consistently it's brought to life it reduces stigma it helps people remember those sort of key messages i've got two more questions for you if that's okay sure so we uh, on our social media as part of mental health month have been sharing some of the questions we like to ask ourselves our team in terms of or others in terms of our health and well-being and the question I like to ask myself or when I'm um, facilitating workshops is what have we learned about ourselves during COVID-19? I think it's a really powerful question. Mm, yeah. Is there a question you would ask yourself or others that you think can support our wellbeing? Uh, I love that one. What have I learned? Um, question I ask, I'll, 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 question I ask of myself is around what's important right now. Mm. And that just helps me stay present in the moment rather than being too concerned about what's just happened or what's about mm. that, what's, what's important right now. Um, question that I like to ask of other people is sort of around the sort of, you know, how are you going? Yeah, I'm fine. Can we talk about objectives one, two, three? <laughs> like, will you tell me if you're not okay? Or mm. I know, what are the signs that I need to look for as your manager? 
um, if, if things are not okay or you're struggling and, and you know, will you tell me? Uh, I like that question because yeah. it, it, it does go a little bit deep and it, and it really you know, opens the door for another conversation. I love that. And hopefully people who have dialed in today will get a sense of how they might apply that. I think it's such a, a beautiful question. My last question for you was to s'more or not to s'more by the campfire. Do you put marshmallows in two bickies and melt chocolate around it? Oh, yes. Um, I didn't even know what s'mores were, but I did um, with my family a couple of years uh, ago in, in US and uh Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> that is a thing that I encourage anyone who's not tried it yet on board the S'mores bus. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Craig, for giving us 30 minutes of your wisdom um, today. And thank you for everyone who's dialed in from wherever you have. Uh, I wanted to finish off by saying thank you for contributing to Mental Health Month here and opening up the dialogue around how we can support ourselves and others. Um, for those who want to know a little bit more about the Oranges Toolkit, there's a QR code on the screen there that you can find out more. But um, in essence, when you choose the Oranges Toolkit, you're also helping kids with cancer. So thank you again, Craig. Uh, and we hope you have a lovely weekend. You too. Enjoy your week off. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.